Thank you. Werner, did you want to respond to any of Alan's comments? First of all, a very good analysis of the main strands and then strategic choices we have made. Specifically on enforcement, and you're quite right to say that we put particular emphasis on that because this was one of the drivers as well that the perceived lack of enforcement or enforceability even of existing laws, because we're not so much talking about the new rules. That's, a, that's another chapter, of course, how can we make sure that the DSA in itself will be properly enforced? But the starting point was also to see how can existing rules from the unsafe products, uh, non-compliant products to illegal hate speech, how can we ensure uh, improve um, enforceability there while at the same time saving our wonderful single market? We have this country of origin principle. In the past, up until now, member states have lost trust in that system. They are saying, well, um, you know, platform A has huge effects on my society, economy, lots of risks and problems and what have you. Uh, but yet this platform is established somewhere else in another member state. Uh, they don't do anything. Uh, and the platform also says none of my business and I'm protected by liability or whatever it is. Uh, and so therefore the natural reflex is to, to regain national control. And that's what some member states have been trying to do. And they know we have to you know, protect our citizens and nobody else does, so we will. So in the first instance, this, this coordination mechanism works in both ways. Domestically, this, this digital service coordinator will be this one voice in Brussels, because since we're talking about any type of content or illegality out there, in practical terms, you would have very different authorities. You would have the media regulators for hate speech, probably. You would have the market surveillance authorities. You would have the consumer protection authorities. You would have the data protection authorities. You would have the uh, probably a whole range of bodies that deal with terrorist content, bodies that deal like the in-hope network with uh, child pornography. So we can't, of course, then have 200 people in the room in Brussels. So we want one in Brussels, and that is the digital service coordinator. They would at home have the role of enforcing the DSA. So, and they have a clear, as you rightly said, um, the clear powers of enforcement and the fines, of course, everybody always talks about the fines, but that comes at the end, right? There are, there are other stages way before that, but still clear powers and obligations for the home state to enforce those rules. But then if they disagree with one another and say, well, this other member state, you know, just protects the platforms and doesn't do any of this, then we meet in Brussels and then we turn to this other authority and say, listen, uh, report back to us. What is your analysis? What are you doing? What are you not doing? Uh, and if then that that national uh, national coordinator of establishment can't come with a satisfactory answer, well, then that also moves to Brussels and we will collectively enforce that. And when it comes to the very large platforms, uh, it's definitely in Brussels at the end of the day. And that's also where a lot of resources will, of course, be uh, put in place, additional resources to deal with the enforcement of this law. So that's a very European story, but we have to find solutions to enforce existing laws, to enforce the new laws, uh, and that in a, in a cross-border situation and with very large players that have a pan-European importance, and therefore also the enforcement will be of a pan-European nature. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and turning now to Fiona Scott Morton. Uh, as well as turning to the uh, Digital Markets Act primarily. Um, Fiona, you're a professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. You served previously in the antitrust division of the Justice Department, and you've testified before Congress on antitrust matters in the digital realm. Um, what are your uh, takes on the, uh, the Digital Markets Act? What what do you think makes a lot of sense? What questions do you have uh, in terms of uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to use these uh, new approaches? Fiona. Thank you, Susan. And thanks to the German Marshall Fund for the invitation to speak uh, today. Um, I wanted to draw the audience's attention, I think first to the kind of amazing time period in which we are living where in the last few months we've seen the United States uh, actually try to use antitrust against large platforms for the first time in 20 years. And I refer to the D 
DOJ's Google case, the FTC's Facebook case and the states, and the House report on digital platforms. Uh, and I think that's particularly interesting because at the same time that we're seeing the United States double down on antitrust, we're seeing the Europeans giving up on antitrust in the sense that these, this is not an antitrust uh, document. This is about regulation. This is about saying perhaps our antitrust cases have not given us uh, the remedies, the outcomes that we wanted. Three cases against Google and nothing much has changed. Uh, and maybe enforcement is not strong enough, as Werner said a minute ago, and so we're going to use a different tool. So while in the United States we might congratulate ourselves on keeping up because we finally have antitrust enforcement, I think that's really not true. I think we're still a whole uh, step behind. Um, two elements of this proposal stand out to me. Um, and they stand out for transferring leverage or power from the business, from the platform itself to the business users that are normally constituting one side of, of one of these big platforms. Uh, so the first one is uh, 5C that says business users are basically, I'll paraphrase, business users are free to disintermediate the platform. So they're free to develop direct relationships with their consumers reach them directly or through a rival platform, and that can't be prevented by the existing incumbent platform. And then another one that I think is quite uh, powerful is 6H and I that says business users are entitled to get useful machine readable, uh, usable copies of their data and so that they can port it to other platforms and rivals. And moreover, they're entitled to get that in real time, which is, uh, I think, another way of saying interoperability, uh, if you're gonna get the data in real time. And that those business users have free and unhindered access to their own data that they and their users generate, and also data that's inferred from them and their users. So that's really quite a lot of what a platform has, holds, and develops uh, to be its competitive advantage in the marketplace. Um, so I think those, I would draw the, uh, the listener's attention to those, those elements. Uh, what do I love? Uh, so I, of course, love the part about getting researchers to have access to the data and exploring it and uh, providing feedback to regulators and the public. I think this is really underutilized in the United States. If you, if you let the nonprofit sector loose on problems, uh, they often are very creative in figuring out things that uh, the government uh, just hasn't thought of. So that and the transparency uh, seem unambiguously great to me, as well as notification of all acquisitions. Uh, very straightforward. I think the main trade-off that we're seeing here that I would identify as an economist is what this regulation is doing is saying, look, the innovation by business users on one side of this platform is, is limited under in the current regime and we want to free that up. And we think that there's going to be benefits to consumers and society from more innovation and expansion and investment there. And that will outweigh whatever loss of investment and innovation is uh, on the part of the platforms because the law, these regulations will constrain what the platforms can do while at the same time enabling uh, the smaller businesses. So I think that's the trade-off. And I would say economists don't really know the general answer to that, which one's bigger. Um, I think, you know, following on the discussion from the Digital Services Act, it seems to me that the way this trade-off is being decided is by saying, look, uh, when you put these rules in place, you get some benefits like democracy and other sorts of uh, social benefits that we need to add to the economic benefits. And once you include those, it's therefore uh, clear which way you want to move the regulation. Um, but as an economic matter, there's lots to measure and debate and discuss and study uh, going forward. I'll stop there, thanks. Werner, your thoughts? Well, many thanks for, for this, Fiona. From your first statements, of course, we are starting from the same assumption that antitrust has come to its limits as far as we are concerned. You, you know, of course, that my boss in the last mandate was trying everything she could uh, to forcefully enforce antitrust law vis-a-vis -vis the very large platforms with very limited success at the end of the day. Um, and we are still uh, 
seeing lots of complaints by many other market participants uh, of different sizes in different sectors. Um, so it's not just you know some companies and types of companies that would complain and be affected, but it's pretty much everybody. And we also have, by the way, a lot of tech companies that vigorously complain about the anti-competitive practices of the other but bigger tech companies of which there are quite a number of US companies and of course many other businesses across the economy. So we really feel that there is a problem and this problem has not been, we have not been able to fix these problems with antitrust. It doesn't mean that we've been antitrust. Yeah? We're very clear that we will keep using our arsenal of competition law enforcement wherever it's appropriate, but still we hope to evacuate quite a number of problems uh, in the digital sphere with this regulation, which does not depend on a, on a dominance test and abuse test and what have you, but which are saying, if you have that function in the market, then there are certain things that you just can't do. Uh, it's a bit of a shortcut, but I think that will be much more effective. The practices themselves, and you mentioned two, uh, but there are many others, were of course largely inspired by previous enforcement work, right? I mean, they didn't fall out of the sky, uh, but we have really tried to capture those types of practices that we have found to be most anti-competitive. And that's why you find them in this regulation. That you have uh, trade-offs um, is obvious. Um, I mean, first of all, I think there is no law uh, that has ever been passed without any trade-offs involved. Otherwise, you wouldn't need a law, probably. So there's always things to be reconciled and balanced out and, you know, those may win a bit and those may lose a bit and what is more, what is less. Then here on top of it, it's not just between the current gatekeepers and either their competitors or would be competitors or their users. You also have then societal interests that kick in. So if you then sort of have all the balls in the air, sort of, you know, who is concerned by all of this at the end of the day, it's everybody. Uh, then you have to, make choices somewhere, and I'm not even claiming that we made the perfect choices. Yeah, It's it's a fact of life that regulation entails trade-offs, and we just hope to get them as right as possible. Uh, Alan, Fiona, and Ivarna, did you have any uh, further reaction to the conversation and any quest specific questions for Werner? Alan, go ahead. Well, uh, two quick things. One is um, in terms of just, this is an addition to some of the things I said, I, I just uh, in terms of, a, a, a sh I did want to offer a shout out in terms of things that we like to the transparency reporting uh, that's that's throughout this. And I think that uh, just to riff off of something that Fiona said about the power of putting information in the hands of the public, uh, we do think that that's, going to be extremely important and a powerful tool both for researchers and for the public and I note in particular a great example of this is for the very large platforms in the DSA the creation of uh, ad archives where you could see not just political ads which is something people have been talking about in the U.S. but all advertisements something that Mozilla thinks uh, in particular would be very important so I think putting putting more data in the hands of the public is going to be a very important move here. Um you mentioned what's going on in the US as well. Uh, that brings up a subject that is uh, hopefully an important piece of this puzzle. And that is to what extent can we have uh, greater engagement uh, in these matters on both sides of the Atlantic? How can we be working together on this? And what thoughts uh, you might have from the commission side, uh, Werner? on how the EU and the US can be working to further develop these issues during this period of time uh, that, uh, that the uh, two roles are under debate. We'll start with Werner on that and then uh, uh, the uh, respondents, Fiona in particular, can respond on that. Werner. Yeah, thank you very much. Very important issue and very high on our agenda as well. Uh, now, of course, with the new relationships uh, and the new trans transatlantic relations with the new uh, uh, administration coming in, we are, of course, very eager and interested to discuss these issues together, right? Because we, we feel that um, we have so many things in common in, the, in, in general, but in the digital world in particular. 
So that's not just limited to the to platform regulation. And as I said at the beginning, uh, you are having pretty similar debates. You may not always come to this, reach the same conclusions. Uh, but it's not that the issues that we have identified are totally unknown or you know unnoticed in the US. So I think there is a broad alliance. It just happens a bit more complicated that many of the companies concerned tend to be American. But that doesn't mean that all Americans would be happy with all of the practices. So I, I think in, in, in terms of substance, uh, many American citizens would also want to benefit from greater transpar transparency and accountability. Uh, and many American companies uh, would like to have fairer competition when using or competing with platforms. Uh, same applies, by the way, beyond the DSA and the DMA. We're having discussions on artificial intelligence. We're having discussions on data. Uh, so everything around these new technologies where the US uh, and the EU are clearly like-minded countries, right? We may have a, a slight disagreement here or there, but overall in the, in, the, in the greater scheme of things, globally speaking, I mean, we should do together as much as we can. Of course, we are regulating now, but I mean, that is, you know, we have been looking at these things for years and at some stage we said we have to intervene now because there's, 450 million Europeans that are concerned by this on a daily basis, right? Ideally, of course, we would have drawn up together laws and uh, the US uh, European law, but that's not quite how things work. But I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunity and room for cooperation and discussion. Fiona. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, draw people's attention to two forces that I think will be important in uh, determining convergence. One is the fact uh, uh, that many companies, as Werner said, they technology American technology companies come to Europe and complain. I think if you're not one of these four platforms, you may be quite keen on this kind of regulation because it might help you compete and it might enable you to uh, stop um, to, to retain some of the profits that you think that you're entitled to. What that means from a political perspective is that companies other than say the biggest five that we're talking about here will go visit their congressperson or their senator and say I'd like to have uh, some of this regulation. So it is not clear to me, I mean my general rule for how regulations work in the United States is that corporations get what they want by going out and spending money to get politicians. And that um, may be true this time, but it may not in the sense that there might be a coalition between consumers and all the companies who aren't the biggest four or five. Uh, and that coalition might actually have enough political power to deliver uh, some regulation. And the second thing that I would draw people's attention to is that there are going to be different products and services and different development of um, ecosystems and innovation in Europe if this regulation goes forward and the United States doesn't do anything. So those of us who look around the world or who travel are going to notice that there's a different quality of life or standard of privacy or innovation in some area in Europe and we don't have that in the United States. And that might serve as a, as a kind of an example that sp spurs action in the United States. I think of biosimilars, for example, in Europe where Innovator Biologics in the United States said we couldn't possibly have biosimilars because people might die, they're dangerous. And Europeans adopted biosimilars and prices went down by 40% and nobody died. And you can point at that and say, wow, why don't we have a similar regulation in the United States since it seems to be so beneficial. So I wonder if as we, if we get divergence, whether we'll be watching each other and that will stimulate uh, change in one jurisdiction or the other. Alan. Uh, well, just to start by saying this is, you know, a very timely conversation to be having, obviously, with a new administration coming in in the U.S., a new Congress starting. There's going to be a tremendous amount of activity in the next six to 12 months on these issues in the U.S. Uh, new bills introduced in Congress, uh, plans being made uh, within new administrations that comes in. And so I think the, the timing couldn't be better for this conversation and this input. You know, if there's, if there's one big thing for the U.S. audience I hope to take away, I hope, it's that 
Um, there's a lot more to talk about here than Section 230 uh, of the Communications Decency Act. You know, we, we've got an almost obsession <laughs> uh, with that issue. And I think member, people on both sides of the political spectrum who agree we should do something about it uh, and about content. But I think one of the big takeaways here is that there are a lot of other levers here, a lot of other moves uh, besides uh, tweaking Section 230. And that's one thing I think a learning from, uh, from these proposals. And um, I would just also then let, lastly just second Werner's point that th there's a lot in common here. When you think this is a, as I said at the beginning, this is a global conversation. Countries all over the world are thinking about putting in place their own uh, regimes around content. Uh, we have the opportunity together and we have a very common worldview uh, together. Um, people like to make uh, a lot of the differences between Europe and the US and there are of course differences, but in the cosmic global scheme of uh, open versus closed societies, we really do have a lot in common and that's really the big opportunity here. Werner, be, besides the uh, platforms uh, and the traditional lobbying groups that undoubtedly will be visiting uh, all of the capitals within, within the European uh, Union over this period of time, as well as Brussels, uh, to what extent are there opportunities, um, direct opportunities for participation in the further development of these two rules, as well as, as Alan was pointing out, and you were pointing out some of the other um, uh, provisions that impact the, uh, the uh, digital ecosystem. Are there, is there speci are there specific ways in which we can encourage that kind of cross-pollination? Well, in terms of process, we are, of course, beyond the stage where we had lots of conferences and stakeholder involvements, and we've, we've done this for, for quite a while, actually, on, on the issues around the Digital Services Act, if you want, that even started 10 years back, you know, uh, and, and has intensified, obviously, in the last one, one, one year and a half, when uh, early drafts of, of ideas were leaked, and ever since then, here, at least in the Brussels bubble, there has been numerous conferences, workshops. We have received hundreds of position papers. Uh, the good thing from all sides of, of society, right? So uh, it was very rich in a sense that from civil rights movements down to the platforms themselves and everybody in between, and that everybody in between is anybody else because there's nobody that is unaffected by the platform economy. It doesn't happen, right? Everybody's either a consumer or an artist or a vendor or a competitor. Um, so in that sense, we had very, very extensive consultations on the DSA side in particular. We've also seen this, that this has translated in knowledge building in the European Parliament, because often you make a proposal, you know, here in Brussels, and the Parliament doesn't really know what this is all about, and there are no experts, right? We have hundreds of people that do this for two years, you know, a lot of fact-finding and meetings and so on. Then we dump a proposal on the Parliament, and they don't know what to do about it. But since they have been involved in all of this process, they've also issued their own report already in advance of our law. And we see a lot of alignment actually of the, of the big orientations. So uh, first of all, in terms of substance, I don't think that we have major disagreement on the main objectives. There will be hundreds of discussions in the margins, uh, but structurally speaking, there will not be another public consultation. Um, it is a bit, as you said, uh, those negotiating will, of course, be influenced by all sorts of things that are going on. Yeah, so every parliamentarian that is about to issue an amendment will, of course, be having their eyes and ears open uh, as much as member states. Um, and so to the extent that anybody makes a substantial contribution, uh, to the extent that you manage to reach those around the table, um, can, of course, still, you know, if there's, let's assume you're a bit undecided, you know, and you have not made up your mind quite yet about, you know, trade-offs and finding the right balance. And then there comes a fantastic study, you know, with a lot of legitimacy behind it and neutral and la la la. Uh, that may obviously then be the moment where a critical mass of people could then take one side rather than the other. Yeah. So no structured process, but mm -hmm. hundreds of openings. 
Okay. Um, we have uh, quite a number of questions from the audience, and I wanted to uh, just begin uh, asking some of these. Uh, several concern uh, Chinese competitors. Um, one uh, a question from Hong Tan was, will the EU digital services regulations overburden U.S. Western platform companies to the advantage of Chinese competitors who don't face the same restraints from their own government. You want to take a stab, Werner? Of course. I mean, that brings me really to the territorial scope, if you want, of the DSA, which is that whoever provides services into Europe uh, is covered by the Digital Services Act, right? Uh, so, and if you have no establishment in Europe, then you would have to have a legal representative in one of the member states of Europe, uh, and you, you have to comply. I mean, that's not a new concept because it already applies, for instance, to, to consumer law, if you want. Yeah? You cannot sell something into Europe and not comply with our binding consumer laws. Enforcement is another issue, but in terms of laws, the same for GDPR. And here it's the same, whoever provides offers product services uh, covered by the DSA into Europe is in scope. Uh, so every Chinese or other operator that wishes to service the European market has to live up to the same obligations. And if there's a Chinese trader selling into Europe, uh, notice in action applies as much as uh, know your business customer uh, and also the, the sanctions apply to such companies. The question is now, will, will, would everybody be in the, in the very large platforms category, but even there, um, some non-American but not European countries are already uh, in scope and they may be in scope tomorrow. So I don't see any distortion here, nowhere actually, because whether European, Chinese or American, everybody that offers those services on the European market is subject to the same rules. Um, Daniel Castro asks, how does the EU plan to create a single set of rules for how platforms treat illegal content in the European digital market when different member states have different definitions of illegal content? That's a brilliant question. Um, the Digital Services Act does not define what is illegal. So we're not harmonizing in a way content as such and say, well, this is the content that is allowed and this is content that is not allowed. Um, I think that will be a, a very big piece of law, uh, a couple of thousands of pages, but also we would negotiate for the next 150 years because in, in Europe, of course, we have this strong history of, we call it subsidiarity in that there are certain things are being agreed at the European level and then we have harmonized laws in certain areas. And, and product legislation would be a case in point, for instance, yeah? because it's very much single market related. Uh, the, the vacuum cleaner sold into Europe would have to face the same rules uh, in, in Sweden and in Greece because that's harmonized law. So in that case, illegality means, of course, European law, uh, but it would happen to be the same in Sweden or in Greece. It does not comply with the European harmonized law establishing safety criteria for vacuum cleaners, right? But then, of course, there are areas of law that we have not harmonized in Europe and will never harmonize in Europe. So we also have, you're quite right, uh, divergences in law across member states. And paid speech is a good example. Uh, the, the, the Germans uh, have different hate speech laws than the French or the Finns. And we're not going to harmonize this here. What we are harmonizing is the procedures around it. I think Alan referred to it as procedural accountability. So it is rather sort of if a platform uh, is confronted with the fact that it has illegal products on offer and they may be either illegal under European law, or they may be illegal under just one member state's law, then they have to act. So we cannot through this act harmonize everything, but we harmonize the way in which we deal with illegal content. Uh, Damien Collins from the UK asks, what possibility will there be for transparency reports from the major platforms to be audited? And would the auditors have access to unpublished 
company data. And I want to, just as a side note uh, to, um, uh, to, for the UK that they uh, issued uh, a set of uh, rules uh, uh, scooping the EU last week. That's not competitive. Go ahead. Yeah, indeed, external audits are part of the game. So it is in this framework uh, established for very large platforms, which starts with this risk assessment along the dimensions that I've mentioned, which then follows up with their, uh, their action plans, how to mitigate those risks. And that will be submitted to ex independent external auditors uh, that will have to meet obviously certain requirements that are also spelled out here. What does it mean to be an external independent auditor? Um, and then this whole thing goes to the board that we've established at the center, this coordination mechanism and the commission. And there, when we are looking into the, into the risk assessment, into the action plan, into the external audit, uh, I think it is then more for the commission to have uh, targeted powers to obtain information to verify, uh, you know, the accuracy of the information provided. So I think the the access to, to data, um, as at least that's my understanding of the text, uh, comes then at this stage of analyzing and challenging, if necessary, the accuracy of those reports. I was impressed with the concept of having a, a, a private external auditors. Um, and um, hopefully it being more of an iterative process where the auditor points out uh, problems or inconsistencies that the, the company has, uh, looks at the uh, algorithms, uh, particularly the referral algorithms to determine if there are specific problems there, and then provides areas where uh, the company can in fact improve. Um, however, that being said, if all of this information is then going up to uh, 27 government officials, essentially. Uh, does that uh, pose a problem in terms of a real cooperative, uh, iterative process between the companies and the independent auditors? In other words, does it work against uh, some of the beneficial elements of that process? My well, history will tell you, yeah. this is a very innovative thing that we're doing here, you know, because the, the challenge was how, how do we challenge those that hold all the information yeah? and how can we make them share with us some information, but not necessarily all. How can we have also proportionate oversight if you want and not too intrusive. So also when it comes, for instance, to the additional information gathering powers of the commission, we also cannot go out and say, well, you show us everything you've got, yeah? So there is always, of course, due, due process obligations on all sides of the game. I don't think that the 27 member states uh, is problematic here. They are sort of uh, also an, an advisory body in a way. So it's not just the commission, but we have 20, 27 around us and with us that also help us to try and understand uh, what is put on our table. But at the end of the day, they are advising the commission in its role of supervising and enforcing and enforcing the mechanism. Uh, Alan, uh, Verna, Fiona, did you have some specific questions that you wanted to raise? I want to make sure you have opportunity to do so in the few minutes that remain. Fiona first, then Verna. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about the market investigation, which in the UK uh, lets you go after a whole um, market and say, look, this isn't working very well, let's impose a remedy. And here seems to have been downgraded to just let's, let's use it to add digital platforms as gatekeepers if we feel that uh, the system isn't working very well. And one of the things I notice about that is that it leaves this regulation only able to control the behavior of the platforms that are gate have gatekeeper status. And if you wanted, say, interoperability across a whole market, there would be no tool with which to regulate everybody else. You could regulate maybe one big platform, but not the many little ones. And that seems to be to be a, a missed opportunity. Go 
Go ahead, Werner. Okay, yeah. I was just waiting for your green light. I would never dare to speak without your permission. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't see it as restrictive as you do. Um, of course, the market investigation tool is firmly anchored in this piece of law. So it is not a totally freewheeling, freestanding uh, power you know, for the commission. It is intrinsically linked, of course, to the substantive purpose and provisions of this regulation. That was also very important, actually, for, for legal reasons. Uh, but that said, first of all, uh, the power to designate uh, gatekeepers of course, also means the power to designate new gatekeepers. And that may also be, of course, the result of ongoing market investigations because there is a requirement to, to, to keep uh, reviewing also the list of gatekeepers, to what extent those that had been identified gatekeeper in the past still are gatekeepers, uh, or to what extent others have come in. So there, it clearly has the power uh, to look into the uh, into the companies themselves. Then they have the power uh, to look into uh, the uh, systemic non-compliance, again here of the existing gatekeepers with these obligations. They have the power to see to what extent the practices themselves are still up to date, because we don't know whether the practices that are in today will still be the most important ones in two years time. Probably some inventive companies may come up with other ways of getting it their way. So there's also the power to see whether practices should be amended, changed, added to this. It's also if they see in a market investigation that there's even new core platform services emerging that we may not know of today, they can also be proposed for addition. So I think um, it has, while it is always limited, of course, to digital markets, um, it has all the dimension it needs in terms of markets, in terms of practices, and in terms of operators that have an entrenched market position or are likely to have an entrenched market position in the future. So I, I do think it covers quite some ground. Averna. Thank you so much. And uh, three quick points that lead in some way to your question. Um, first of all, we talked earlier about participation and this process will be three years long. And I really think in a year where we've seen people taking to the streets across the world asking for racial and societal justice, that we should be mindful of the fact that already in the process so far, we don't see um, as many stakeholders from the groups which risk to be at most risk of the adverse effects, whether it be algorithmic discrimination or others. And I say that also to organizations like the Center for Democracy and Technology that would have, you know, deep technical knowledge. We also have a responsibility to play our part in this participatory process and bring um, and facilitate those other stakeholders to the table. A second point, building on what Alan said, you know, in the United States about it's not all about Section 230. In the European Union, what we're realizing is really the importance of GDPR as a bedrock to all of these conversations about the use of personal data uh, driving, you know, the ad tech models and others. So in Europe, there needs to be, and might be interested to hear from Werner if, if that's factored in, stronger enforcement of GDPR. And in the United States, and my colleagues in Washington are advocating for this, really thinking about federal privacy legislation as a tool to some of, because sometimes that point's not made. And, um, you know, the, the final point, I guess the, the question that I thought would uh, be interesting for, for Werner as well is that as we, you know, what do you think the opportunities will be? We know it'll be three years long. We know we're going to be, you know, there'll be people with power and money. And at the same time, we've all said that democratic and participation is really important. So I was just, you know, wondering, would the, will, will the commission later on in this process, do you think there will be, if not uh, formal, informal ways to really bring all that, that broader stakeholder approach? Because we talked a lot today about consumers. And again, in human rights, I think we should, we should remember people, those whose rights are affected beyond those who are particularly spending uh, money online. Thanks so much. Werner? Yes, uh, on, on your third and, and first point. Um, first of all, the contribution made by um, call it civil society uh, or organization like your own, um, has been quite substantial throughout. Yeah, it is not that um, you collectively have not contributed a lot in different ways, contributed to the public consultations, submitted papers to us, 
uh, in rich workshops and so on and so forth. So I think the, the, the input uh, from all parts of society have been quite extraordinary. Also, if I look back in my sort of uh, quarter of a century experience as a policymaker in Brussels, so it has been a very inclusive process. And as I said, there will be uh, lots of moments to, to bring in new expertise throughout. On your second comment on the GDPR as a bedrock, well, definitely uh, it plays a very important role because on the one hand, data already per se is of concern to citizens and consumers and users sort of that are concerned about what is happening with their data. And, uh, you know, is this all kosher if um, my data are being used left, right and center and have a really given uh, explicit consent uh, and knowing consent to all of this, yeah. Um, so this sort of citizen empowerment perspective is important. But then of course also on the other side, the market power consequence of privileged access and use of all data. So in that sense, data from different dimensions is probably, uh, you know, go going through both legal acts in, in many, many iterations. Uh, quite importantly, what you said is right, enforcement of GDPR as well should be facilitated by all of this. Uh, and largely there would be transparency obligations of sorts, but still um, um, it, it helps uh, to see to what extent of what, what platforms are doing. And then uh, also with the help of researchers and others, uh, you can double check whether that's true. I mean, we have general advertising transparency in the DSA that everybody, when I see an ad online, I need to know it's an ad. I need to know where it's coming from. And I need to know why I saw that and whether it was based on profiling. I will get the same information when it comes to recommender systems. I even need to get an option to say, I don't want stuff recommended to me, whether it's products or content uh, that is based on my profile. So I can even opt out of this profiling. There is the ad repos repositories that we have talked of. But even in the DMA, in the Digital Markets Act, there's also an external audit obligation uh, about, the, about profiling. So companies have to be audited to the extent that their profiling activities are also compliant. So I think we, we have quite some hooks uh, and, and, and basis for further analysis uh, and then also action in terms of enforcement if need be. Thank you. Uh, Alan, uh, your last uh, comment or question. As well, we only have be a comment. Minutes. A comment or a question, but I'll say very quick. It's very, it's uh, at listening to this, it's, um, it's striking how much opportunity there is. Also, I've said this on the on the global stage, and I'm curious to whether Werner and the um, commission have given much thought to how this scales globally, and particularly if it's sort of the golden rule of policymaking, you know, do unto others, right? If every country were to adopt a similar rule, right? Um, does this make sense? And does this does this work? And I think the answer may very well be yes, but I'm curious if that's part of the policy, policy thinking. And um, I'd encourage it to be because I think there is an opportunity to build something uh, that's harmonized well uh, among many countries. Okay. Uh, Werner, any last 30 second thought? And then we'll Perfect. turn it over to Karen to say goodbye to everybody. Just in response to what Alan just said, the starting point was not an imperialistic move, sort of let's you know regulate things for the whole world, because we are of course starting with our own continent and for with our 450 millions of people in mind. Um, so that's the starting point. Of course, if we are able to to influence the rest of the world and to follow our example, they will only follow example if it makes sense anyway. I think on the on the GDPR side of things, we saw that it worked pretty well. That by, by by and large, lots of other jurisdictions have taken up the same ideas because their citizens were equally concerned about privacy than we were. When we did the business to platform regulation, just half a year later, Jap Japan virtually copied our regulation because they said we're facing the same issues here, and you have found an intelligent solution to that. So in that logic, of course, we would hope that this is, these are standards that are being shared, understood uh, by many others as well. And then that would make it even more effective, of course, than if it were to be limited to Europe. Thank you so much, Werner, for uh, your insightful comments with respect to these two uh, proposed rules, to Alan, Fiona, and Iverna. 
Uh, thank you for participating today with your questions and comments. And Karen, it's over to you. Thank you all so much for this incredibly rich conversation. And I think it's so important, Werner, that as uh, we here start grappling with this uh, in the context of, as Alan said, um, big new thoughts that we're all gonna be having that we, we fully understand uh, and grapple with what you're doing. So uh, thank you for the panel for drawing that out. Thank you to our participants uh, for their fantastic questions, Susan, for your great moderation. I just wanna tell folks um, to stay tuned. GMF Digital is going to be doing a lot of work uh, on, on the transatlantic discussion uh, through our Digital New Deal project. And uh, there'll be a recording of this great discussion if you would follow GMF Digital on Twitter at GMF Digital. So thank you again uh, for a fantastic conversation. Bye-bye.